This is John Groves coming to you from my home studio. For today's Bible talk, I want to take up the story of the transfiguration as it is often referred to in the synoptic Gospels of the New Testament. The word synoptic is used of the Gospels attributed to Matthew, Mark, and Luke because they are written from the perspective of those who accompany Jesus or his contemporaries. The word synoptic is derived from two Greek words, soon and optic, which together mean a general view, what one sees altogether. A synopsis is a general summary of the whole. The Gospel of John does not include the account of the Transfiguration. In fact, many scholars wonder how the Gospel of John made it into the Bible. It was written considerably later and develops a different chronology of Jesus' life and ministry than the other Gospels. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 13, we find the account of Jesus taking his disciples, Peter, James, and John, up a high mountain. When they reach the top, Jesus is transfigured as related in our New Revised Standard Version and many other English translations. Our account reads that Jesus' face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Then Moses and Elijah suddenly appeared talking to Jesus. The underlying Greek term for transfigured is the past tense in the passive voice of the verb from which we derive the term metamorphosis, meaning changing form. We typically use this term with regard to caterpillars turning into moths and butterflies. Here, the change may not seem as extreme, but it is still notable. I now want to share uh, Raphael's portrayal of this scene. Raphael's painting of the Transfiguration was completed sometime between 1516 and 1520. It is now located in one of the Vatican galleries. Originally, it was part of a dual commission. Another artist completed a painting of the raising of Lazarus. Art critics have either decried or regarded Raphael's painting as the single best oil painting in the world. It held on to this distinction for well over 300 years, according to art historians. The painting has a storied history. Originally commissioned for a French cathedral, it was appropriated for the Vatican. Later, Napoleon took it from Rome and placed it in one of the galleries in the Louvre. After Napoleon's defeat, it was returned to Rome. The painting depicts two scenes. The top half portrays the transfiguration with the three disciples in the forefront. And you can see the figures of Moses and Elijah alongside Jesus. The bottom half portrays the healing of the demon-possessed young man with a large crowd of observers. You can see a young man with his right arm raised being held by a man in a green tunic. This healing, as related in the Synoptic Gospels, takes place directly after the Transfiguration. Some added details from the story are worth highlighting. All three Gospel accounts relate that the disciples Peter, James, and John heard a voice from a cloud that had overshadowed them. In Matthew, the voice says, This is my Son, the Beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Matthew adds, in contrast to Mark and Luke, that the disciples became afraid. According to Matthew, Jesus came to them and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they only saw Jesus. Fear is a natural reaction to something happening that is incomprehensible. Bertrand Russell, the British philosopher and mathematician, held that religion is based on fear. 
whether it be a fear of death or divine judgment affecting one's life or afterlife. He delivered a famous lecture in 1927 entitled, Why I Am Not a Christian. In it, he affirmed his refusal to accept religious dictates. We can even, you can even read support for the notion of fear as the basis for religious thought in the statement that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, as related in the first chapter of Proverbs. But this fear need not be a constant and sustained response. In the apostolic letter, 1 John, chapter 4, verses 16 and 18, we read the following, which I have taken the liberty to abridge. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. This text, intended to inspire confidence in the then nascent Christian faith, can well inspire us to claim and affirm that love is the most powerful force in the universe. And with it, we have the potential to accomplish whatever we set for ourselves. We may not experience something like the transfiguration in our lifetimes, but we can be assured that love, divine love, is part of everything we think, feel, and do. Moses and Elijah in our story represent the law and the prophets, the authorities governing life among the Jews. The emergence of Jesus the Christ abiding in our eyes and in the disciples' eyes and standing at the center in conversation with Moses and Elijah signals, in my estimation, the presence of love as a dominant force or influence in our world. Charles Fillmore wrote about the transfiguration in his metaphysical Bible dictionary as follows. The Christ is a transfigured one. We perceive it when we ascend into a high place, into the secret place of the Most High, when we lift up our thoughts. The apostles of Jesus represent the faculties of the spiritual man. When we lift up our faculties, we behold spiritual reality and we see the body as it is in truth, refined and vitalized in every cell, quickened and harmonized in every function, transformed into a body of living, luminiferous energy, beautiful, strong, whole, young, eternal, incorruptible, a true center of the divine energy. Fillmore clearly admired the transfigured state and likely envisioned it as a refinement of the self in its divine glory. For our purposes, we can be satisfied that merely aspiring to become more spiritual, we would live our lives more fully. In that respect, love supplies the energy for that journey. May our countenances, countenances display the love that animates who we are and what we feel, think, and do. Until next time, this is John Groves.